humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. We're talking about D&D &D again, because of course we are. I just love it so much. A stack of you did express interest in the comments of my last D&D &D video uh, regarding my sort of injuries and death systems. And I realized immediately after receiving those comments that my the way I handle death isn't exactly like a mechanical system so much as a narrative element. So it probably wouldn't be able to fill up a whole video on its own, so I'm chucking it in. With injuries, you get both, it's a twofer. So I mean, I guess real quick, um, the way that I handle death, this seems like a nonchalant way to handle death. We should be more somber. The way that I handle death in a Dungeons and Dragons game. It comes down to that ever-present question of how do we make death still like a proper risk and something that carries narrative weight in a game where you can resurrect people. By now I'm sure we all know and love Matt Mercer's uh, system of resurrection and I absolutely incorporate things like the, the offerings to the resurrection ritual. Love it. Brilliant narratively dramatic, but just adding to the cinematic vibe of it uh, in order to sort of limit how powerful resurrection is in my games, just to nerf it just a little bit. Just, I just want to punch up, just punch up that adrenaline a little bit, like maybe it genuinely won't happen. So my narrative excuse for this is that uh, in my setting, the way a resurrection works is uh, that the cleric who is casting the resurrection spell, basically it's like a good horcrux. They split off a tiny little bit of their soul, they sacrifice a little bit of their soul in order to pin the soul of the deceased into their body. So it forms this link, this soul link, if you will. Hey, shout out to the Pokemon Let's Play nerds on the internet. So yeah, basically just a piece of the cleric who brought them back is, is holding their, their soul into their body. Which means a couple of things. First of all, I like to say that it means that no cleric can resurrect the same one person more than once. The party cleric would be able to resurrect every other party member once, but after that they're gonna have to start actually trying to make the trek to find other clerics in time to resurrect the deceased. Which I'm not sure yet whether or not I'd put like a time limit on that, like saying, oh, you have to do it before the next moon because that's when the souls depart, that sounds cool. But I've not had to deal with death that much yet, so... It also means, just for a cool, like, role-playing avenue, because I think that players who have died and come back, in my experience, mostly, they want to have a thing that they can latch on to say, like, wow, this is a reminder that I carry with me. And at first I used a bunch of different uh, suggestions on Reddit, or like, roll tables that would give you a mark of the grave. And those are really cool, I love the idea of getting, like, just a one-off aspect of a lot of undead creatures. The idea that you don't have a reflection, just like a vampire doesn't have a reflection, because you're dead and somehow the universe knows it. But after a while that all got really really complicated and in the end I decided to just go with the uh, the concept of the eyes are the window to the soul. And so uh, when someone is resurrected, brought back from the dead by a cleric, uh, one or both of their eyes change colour to the colour of the cleric's eyes. To reflect that they've got a piece of someone else's soul in their body, shoved in there. And it also means I have judged that uh, if the cleric who performed the resurrection were to die and their soul depart at the next new moon or whatever, what have you, then anyone that they have their soul pinning to the mortal plane would die also. Which gives you some really cool hooks, but it would only be the cleric who last resurrected them. So maybe suddenly the clerics who've resurrected one of your party members start being targeted and killed. And you find out that an old enemy of the party, unable to get to them directly, has been hunting down the clerics one at a time trying to find the one that performed this last resurrection. I don't know, just some thoughts. By the way, just, just for the record, I'm not that good of a DM, I just think a lot. So take everything I say and just just throw it into the Dead Sea. Because, like, that's the amount of salt that you should be using when I'm talking to you about this stuff. You gotta tweak it. You gotta make it work for you and your game. So that's my really quick thing on death. Now, injuries. This is my uh, pre-organized notebook. You can see it's just full of just random, random mixed notes. It's impossible to find anything in here. I think the important thing when it comes to injuries, at least in my game, because everyone is really looking for that sort of cinematic, character-driven experience, what it comes down to is everyone wants cool scars, but they want them to feel 
right. You know, it has to it has to feel appropriately dramatic and and earned if that makes sense. And also remember that I devised this because so many of my player characters uh, took medicine as one of their skills and I didn't want that to go to waste so I wanted to uh, devise a system that would create situations in which they would encounter injuries that would not be healed via magic. So here's what I've put together. So if a player of level 3 or above takes more than half of their total hit points worth in one strike of damage, they must make a constitution save of DC 15 or suffer a potentially mortal wound. So I personally set my mark at level three, which is when most of my players will have over 20 hit points. You might decide that you want to up the level of that. Similarly, the DC is 15. That's quite a high DC in some ways. So you might want to lower the DC. The choice is yours. But I think do remember that uh, the DC, I think is allowed to be a little bit higher because it already has the prerequisite of they need to have met a certain threshold of damage taken in one strike. Note that it's not one turn, it's one strike. So they have to take a certain amount of damage in one hit. Secondly, they need to uh, fail a DC 15 constitution saving throw. So only after that, a failed save uses its total result to determine the wound sustained. So that's like a lot of requirements to hit an injury, but I think that's important for the sake of an injury feeling important. That's why I can't quite get behind fumble tables being used for injuries because it'll just be like, you rolled a one, you have to roll a crit fail on this, uh, you know, D100 thing and then Oh, you lost your foot, which, I mean, losing your foot seems weird. Or like losing an, you lose your nose, you lose your ear. That's not a fun injury. We want these to be fun, dramatic injuries. People want the sense of mortal dread, but they want it to be cool mortal dread. I'm gonna have to type this up and throw it up on the screen or something for you. So as it nears the DC, the injuries tend to be less severe, because if they do roll a one, oh boy! If they get an 11, a 12, or a 13, the character suffers a broken bone. A lot of issues come up where people are like, right, but what if it was like a fireball? That's not a thing where you like break your bone. So you just gotta work into the narrative. They're blasted back by the fireball, they trip over a rock, they land badly on their shoulder, they shatter their collarbone. You know, I do try to make uh, most of these injury descriptions as vague as possible so that you can make them fit the scenario, but they do have some distinction between them to explain the mechanical effects. So with a broken bone, the player at the beginning of their turn has to make DC 12 constitution saves to either move at full speed or to attack without disadvantage, and that's depending on where you place the wound. So that's up to you as a DM. If you decide that they've fallen and they've shattered their collarbone, like I said, then that's more likely to give them a disadvantage to their attacks than it is to halve their movement, you see? And do remember that they only get halved movement or disadvantage on attacks if they fail that constitution save, that extra save. So like they can overcome their wounds temporarily in order to fight, but the pain's gonna come in waves and potentially overwhelm them, which is reflected as well in if they reach three fails on these uh, DC 12 constitution saves, then they fall unconscious. So it places a dramatic risk on the player throughout the rest of the battle without necessarily taking them out of it. With an eight, a nine, or a 10, the results are fairly similar, but this time it's an internal injury. So this one's more up in their organs where things are really, you know, important. Once again, the player has to make a DC 12 constitution save at the beginning of every turn in order to move at full speed and to attack without disadvantage. So this time the movement and the attack are tied in together. And again, if the saves reach three fails, they fall unconscious. Down the lower end of this table, uh, the ranges get smaller as it goes down. So a six or a seven, broken ribs, must make a DC 12 constitution save at the beginning of each turn to move at full speed and attack without disadvantage. And this character who had a total result of six or seven will fall unconscious after three rounds. So the player still gets three rounds in which to do stuff and to try to help the battle, but over time, the energy spent on it is just gonna wear them down. The idea with the broken ribs is uh, almost that one of them has punctured your lungs, so you can keep going, but only for so long before your body just gives out. Four or five is a major leg wound. There is no constitution save for a four or five. This character does take half movement and they will be unconscious in three rounds. With a total of a two or a three, they take a major arm or torso wound and with no constitution save, they take disadvantage on their attack rolls and they will fall unconscious in three rounds. Then we get the extremes. The one and the 14. So a 14 is nearly a save. You really, you nearly, made it, 
without taking this massive injury. With a 14, you get an adrenaline rush. This was something I picked up off Reddit and tweaked. So this character regains one hit die plus their constitution modifier of temporary hit points as well as a dash bonus for three rounds. So they get this huge buff to their stuff for three rounds, but then when the rush wears off, they take three levels of exhaustion. So it's like rewarding the player for nearly getting out of it unscathed, but actually uh, they, in the end, still have this tank. And a one, a natural one with no modifiers on this uh, particular major injury, mortal wound, constitution save is to lose an eye and fall unconscious. Because let's be real, everyone wants to lose an eye. They don't want the stat tanks that come with that usually, but everyone wants to lose an eye. A character with an eye patch? Too cool, come on. So that's the entire table of how these uh, mortal wounds or major injuries work in battle. After battle, uh, all wounds require extended recovery and may leave permanent markers or scars. So now I personally wouldn't actually uh, give any permanent disadvantages to the player character for receiving a mortal wound because I don't think major injuries are meant to be about punishing the players. They're meant to be about uh, the sensation of risk and the dramatic feeling of nearly dying. We don't actually, like, there's there's a certain place for simulation in D&D, and there's a certain place for just cool storytelling, you know? And I think that the simulation half of major injuries should exist in the battle in which they are sustained, and the rest of it should be allowed to be cinematic storytelling. So after the battle, I would suggest that um, these are injuries that you shouldn't heal with magic, you could try, but it would do things like if you uh, try to heal a broken bone with a healing spell or with potion, then that bone is gonna fuse together wrong, it's gonna set wrong. It's gonna be uh, a little bit like in the Chamber of Secrets when uh, Lockhart tries to fix Harry's broken bone but his bone just goes away. I'm making a lot of Harry Potter references today. I'm down with it. And especially if you keep in mind that the loss of hit points isn't necessarily all injuries, then it makes it really kind of easy to hand wave and describe away the reason that magic can't heal this thing and you need to use like traditional human medicine. And uh, I don't know, I'd probably put some arbitrary number of long rests that they have to take before they can adequately heal that injury using magic. So no like permanent loss to hit points or anything like that. They've already taken their beating for the injury, and they're already going to carry through the dramatic narrative implications of that major wound and the scar that it wrought throughout the game anyway. You don't need to remind them with a mechanical deficiency. I'm editing the video now and it's just occurred to me that I didn't talk about the added threat of death, I guess, in terms of uh, when you fall unconscious. I suppose it would go into the natural 5th edition mechanic of your rolling death saves now. And so given the idea that I've introduced that these are wounds that shouldn't be healed by magic, they should take longer to heal, they should be healed through, you know, very human means, through medicine checks, I'm suddenly realizing what a risk that could seem. Because they're over there, they're on the ground, unconscious, dying, rolling death saving throws, and you can't use your spells to heal them. I would quite simply say that uh, you can stabilize them with a medicine check, which I think, I think that's just how the rules work anyway. I'd maybe ditch the medicine kit? I don't even remember how the medicine kit works. Just let people make a medicine check, they put points into that skill, let them do it, let them stabilize their friend. Or if they're really in a pinch, they can of course use magic that will stabilize the person on the ground possibly even bring them back to consciousness if you rule it that way. But then keep in mind that now they've got this weird, like, the, like a broken arm that's healed wrong. So that could be just potentially another risk that you have to throw into battle. That's a choice that they have to make of, I, this person could die, I can only heal them via this magical means, and then they might wake up, be back in the battle, but they might be permanently stuck with whatever their negative trait of that battle was. I mean, they can obviously fix it later, that can be an extra element of the story that they then have to re-break the arm and set it properly, you know? But in the meantime, for the sake of the combat, for the battle, this person that had a broken arm or a broken collarbone or whatever, suddenly now, because they have been healed and it's, it's fused wrong, now they have to make their attacks with disadvantage. You know, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. So, just thought I'd throw that in there. So that is how I handle death and major injuries in the game 
of Dungeons and Dragons. My legs are doing stuff too, you just can't see it. So I hope that you enjoyed that, I hope that you found it useful. Apart from that, I do believe we're done for the time being. Email this to your grandma and I'll see you some other time. for you.